Good morning and welcome to worship. Good morning. Or let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon or good evening if you're watching this later. We are glad that you are here this third Sunday of Advent, a joy Sunday. And uh, remember that our mission of the month is the Meal Barrel Project, which is a local food ministry. Uh, and uh, as Debbie told us last week, feeds many hundreds of hungry people. Also remember, uh, especially those of you who are official members of Old Brick, our annual congregational meeting will follow immediately follow worship. We will be uh, voting on a session member because uh, Doris Brock is going off the session. And we will also be um, voting on the budget for 2022. If you are not a member, you are more than welcome to stay. Uh, but if you need to leave and beat the Baptist to the restaurants, that's okay. Uh, you can feel free to leave. And we'll give you a moment to do so before we actually begin the meeting. All right, Debbie has the rest of the announcements. Lots of things going on. Good morning, and what a great day today, Oak Brick. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and it is the, we'll light the candle of joy. And joy, as most of you know, is not a fleeting thing. It's something that stays with us all the time. We can be happy and sad, but joy, if we know Jesus, is always in our hearts. So to me, this is a very exciting day, and we have some great people to um, light our candle today. And in, in their honor, if you're a little insert, if you look at it, we have some easy cookie recipes. Because for children, a lot of times they want to help in the kitchen, and it gets a little complicated. So we're uh, going to have some easy recipes. And Erica, if you'll come up here, we've got something. Uh, Ashley's going to give all the little children. We've got um, cookie mixes and sprinkles and uh, all kind of good things. They're going to light our candle a little bit later. But we wanted to bless them with, uh, <laughs> and they're going to be able to go home and make these recipes. So I told them if they'll be really good today, they can take that home with them and make all kind of cookies. But thank y'all for coming today and blessing us. Um, tonight, well, this afternoon from 4 to 7 is our live nativity. All of the people that are participating, if you want to participate, if you just want to be in on all the things that are going on, try to be here at 3 o'clock. And we're going to park in the back field. So when people drive up, it's going to be beautiful. They're going to come up. They're going to hear carolers. They're going to go see the live nativity. And I'm telling you, it's going to be great. Um, make sure this afternoon to send those texts out to your friends, send messages, and let them know. Because this really is going to be a beautiful event and something that I hope we can do for many, many years to come. Um, and lastly, we do have a nativity scene that has been donated uh, in memory of Betty Goins to our children's department. And by the way, Emily, it's in the children's department. I left it in there for you. And we also have one in the window over here that was given in uh, Miss Betty Goins' memory. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew about that. And now let's all celebrate the Advent season and uh, the Sunday of joy. children at that time. 
So Jesus called us three years ago and said, now it's time for you to be foster parents. You're going to bring the joy to these children, and you're going to allow them to have lives that they may not possibly have. So since that time, we've had 21 children in our home, which I know my mom thought I was crazy at first, but we now have eight beautiful children, three of whom have been adopted, and one more that's going to be released from DHR care next week in our home. So I just want you all to know that just because you think that it's something that you want to do at the time, Jesus always has a different plan for you. Thank you. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Some of us are very stressed during the holiday season. Some of us are even distressed during the holiday season. Some of us are downright exhausted. Let's begin, continue our worship by simply pausing for a moment, taking a deep breath, and resting in the presence of our Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's continue our worship. If you are able, please stand for our call to worship. Come and rejoice in God. Sing praise to God continually in our lives. Let all the people praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we will do that in song. Turn to page 181, which the world will do in verses 1, 2, and 4. Too easily and exhausted, 
we fall into restless sleep. Heal our hearts and spirits, Lord. Help us understand that you do not ask us to heal everything, but rather to find a simple way in which we might lighten someone else's burden as you have lightened our lives. You have brought hope and peace to us. Now cause us to rejoice in the wondrous things that you have done. Teach us to use our gifts for the common good, and that in helping we may find great and abundant joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we continue with our silent and personal prayer of confession. By the authority of the bringer of joy, all of our sins, misdeeds, failures, and mistakes are forgiven, and we can continue worshiping in song. <clears throat>
Donnie, Ashley, Donna K. Gary, if you were watching, we hope you did well quickly. I don't want to have to sing for you again like what we just did. Um, let's turn our attention then to our lectionary readings for the day. Not every song in the Old Testament is in, or in the Bible, is in the book of Psalms. The Psalms, of course, are songs. Uh, many of them were sung in the temple worship. Some were still sung in, in, in synagogue services in Hebrew. But one of the songs is in Isaiah 12, verses 2 through 6, and so we will read that. Isaiah 12, 2. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And then Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Another song of joy. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change, change their shame into praise and renown all the earth. At that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. And then another uh, classic statement about praise, or about joy rather, in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, the apostle says, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then our gospel reading, picking up where we left off from Luke chapter 3 about the ministry of John the Baptist. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. It is perhaps a worn out word, this word repentance. To many it has a very negative connotation. It makes us think of hellfire and brimstone preaching with fear and terror. It's kind of a worn out word. And yet, and yet, John says it is necessary, necessary for living a God-centered life, which really is what the Jewish background for repentance means, turning from a self-centered life to a God-centered life. That's the essence of what repentance means in its Jewish background. But why would we want to do that? Why would we want to give up our self-centered living? Well, we would want to do that only if it's not working. Only because it's not working. Every therapist knows that we will not change until the pain of staying as we are becomes greater than the pain of changing because change is always painful. And so if our way of living has painful consequences and we can see even more painful consequences down the road, then we might be willing to change. As John puts it, the ax has already been laid at the root of the trees. And if we can see that, if we can feel that in ourselves, then we might be willing to change. Just this week, I had a conversation with a recovering addict who knows that he's walking the edge of a knife. One more slip up, and he's going away for a very long time. Or, this time, he will die from the overdose. The ax is already laid at the root of the tree. And so, we may want to change because our way of life isn't working. Because we can see consequences down the road that we don't want to deal with. Suppose we do want to change then. Suppose we want to live a more God-centered life, a more disciple life, a more Christ-like life. What does that look like? What do we do? Well, John helpfully spells out the answer in detail in response to three questions, basically the same question that three groups of people make to him. What then should we do? What should we do? to prove to you that we really have changed, that we bear the fruits of repentance. What should we do? How should we live then? Well, the question, you know, the questions of the Bible are so provocative, aren't they? We could do a whole long, we could write a book about just the questions of the Bible from beginning to end, all the questions. Here's one of them. How then should we live? What then should we do? How should you and I live? If indeed we want to live a God-centered life, a disciple life, a Christ-like life, well, John's answers are not hard to understand. There are three of them. First, he says, share what we have. He says to those who ask him, what should we do? Share what you have. In verse 11, he says, if you've got two coats, give one away. I mean, who needs two coats, John says? Give one away. If you have food, share it with those who don't have. Now, John's not talking about so much about giving, per se, as sharing. Sharing what we have with those who have less. It's the kind of sharing described in Acts chapter 4 of the early church. No one had any need because the first church, the first Christians shared with one another. So there was nobody, in need, nobody hungry, nobody without adequate clothing, nobody without adequate shelter because they shared what they had. Underlying his advice, obviously, is an appeal to live more simply. Do we really need all that stuff we have? Do we really need all the stuff we buy? I remember years ago seeing a bumper sticker that said, live simply that others may simply live. But it struck me that it was on the bumper of a luxury car. And by the way, let's turn that coin over and look at the other, other side, because this is a, a sticky ethical and theological dilemma that we have in the 21st century. Our economy is very different than the economy of first century Palestine, which was an agrarian subsistence-based economy. We have an industrialized consumer-based economy. If we don't buy all that stuff, 
our economy would collapse. If everybody just cut back on their spending by 10%, we'd have a serious recession. So what do you do? What do we do about that? All, all experts on spirituality say that an important spiritual discipline is simplicity. And of course, we can recognize that just because you and I may live more simply doesn't mean everybody else is going to. But that is a, it's a, it's a bit of a theological and ethical dilemma which we each have to answer for ourselves. But the, the experts on spirituality who say that simplicity is a vital spiritual discipline, the point they're making is that if we are preoccupied and obsessed with things, how can we set our minds on things that are above, as Colossians 3 puts it? How can we set our mind? Well, Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if all of our treasure is invested in more and more things, how do we focus on spiritual things? How do you balance those two things? Well, each of us has to wrestle with that, I suppose. I remember when I was in seminary, the way the social justice issue was presented was an issue of bananas. A banana in, uh, one or two great multinational corporations control the banana industry. And the actual workers are paid a subsistence wage, barely enough to keep body and soul together. So the question was, should you not buy bananas? Because these multinational corporations exploit the workers. But the flip side of that is, if you don't buy bananas, then those workers won't have any job at all. So ethically, what do you do? Sometimes ethical questions are difficult, aren't they? And this certainly is, if we think, if we really think about this passage, it confronts us with some ethical difficulties that we have to wrestle with individually. Now, there certainly are many people who need clothes and food. We are Mission of the Month deals, addresses that in part. But the fact is, most of the people that you and I know, that we rub shoulders with on a daily basis, do not need food and clothes. And of course, some of us genuinely don't have much to share. We need to recognize that also. But everybody needs a caring presence. Everybody needs a caring. There's nobody so rich that they don't need to know that it matters to them, it matters to somebody about them. We all need a caring presence. We all know that we need to know that we matter to somebody. And a rich person can feel just as unloved and just as lonely as a poor person. Money has nothing to do with whether or not we feel important or not whether we feel loved or not. So regardless of the size of our bank account, we all need to feel that it matters to someone about us. And we can all share a caring presence. We all have time. And all of us have the same amount of time every day and every week, don't we? I know that because whenever I've asked God for more hours in the day, he just laughs at me. It doesn't work that way. We all have the same amount of time, right? And we all, then, can share that time. We can be a caring presence in other people's lives. And another universal need that we all have is the need to be heard. We all have a need to be heard. And it costs no money to be generous with a listening ear. So when we talk about sharing what we have, it doesn't necessarily mean money or clothes or food. It may be sharing our presence. It may be sharing our listening ear. And all of us from time to time need a helping hand. In a grief group I facilitate, a woman was sharing with us this week, her husband died two months ago. She wanted to deal with the leaves in her yard. And so she tried to start the gas-powered blower. She could not start it. She could not figure out it brought her to tears, broke down in tears because she couldn't start that floor. She needed a helping hand. She needed, simply needed somebody to tell her how to start this thing. That's all she needed. She didn't, doesn't need money, she's fine, but she needed a helping hand. And so all of us, no matter our income, from time to time need a helping hand, don't we? And some of us, some of us have money and food to share, some of us have skills to share, and all of us have ears to share, 
and all of us have time that we can share. We can all be a caring presence. And so what John said to the crowds on the banks of the Jordan River, he says to all of us, share what you have. Share what you have, whether it be food or clothes or time or listening ears or a helping hand. Share what we have. And then the second thing John says is also very simple. He says, do right. Do right. The tax collectors come to him and say, well, what should we do? And he said, well, don't collect more than you're supposed to. Don't cheat the taxpayers. That's what you do. And the soldiers ask, what do we do? And he said, well, don't extort money from people. Don't make false accusations. Obviously, the fact that John says this means that soldiers in these days, they supplemented their income by uh, accusing somebody of something. Donnie, you broke the law. If you don't want me to turn you in, you better give me some money. Obviously, this was a common practice, so John would not have mentioned it, would he have? Extortion, we call it. Bribery to uh, cover up false accusations. And so John says, be honest. Obey the law. Do what's right. And we hardly, hardly need to elaborate on that, do we? We all have, we have only to listen to or read the daily news about how common dishonesty and law-breaking is. Anytime I look at a, web, a news website, those are all what the stories are all about. Law-breaking of one sort or another. And implicit in this, in what John says, is not manipulating and using other people. He talks about extortion. He talks about threats and false accusations. So implicit also in this is being truthful. Not using lies and distortions and false information to get our way or to get what we want and certainly not using violence because John says these soldiers are threatening people with violence to get what they want. And so implicit in this is not using violence. Wednesday afternoon, I spent most of the afternoon in the emergency room at Crestwood Hospital. Tr Tracy Lovins, who most of you know, her father died, was dying, and I spent most of the afternoon there. And I noticed there are signs posted. I had never seen them before in ERs. I've been in ERs lots of times. Used to be a chaplain on call at a hospital hospital. Sign that says, "Assaulting health workers is a violation of state law," and it gave the law code the section. Violators will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, in early November, I flew to Denver to see my sister. On all four flights before we took off, the pilot gave the same warning. Assaulting uh, flight attendants is a violation of the law, and violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. I've never heard that announcement before on flights. I've never seen those signs before in ERs. Uh, and I've seen signs in restaurants that say abuse of servers will not be tolerated. If you mistreat a server, you will be asked to leave and you will be banned from coming back to this restaurant. Anybody say those signs 10 years ago, 20 years ago? What has become of our society, people? Why do we have to warn people about violence in those ways? Implicit in what John says is to treat others with respect and with dignity, even if we don't like the job they're doing, even if we don't agree with them. Do what's right, he says. Do what's right. So share what you have, he says. Do what's right. And then thirdly, he says, be content with what you have. He tells the soldiers, be satisfied with your pay. Or in other translations, be content with your pay. Be content with what you have. This is the opposite of greed. The opposite of coveting, which Colossians 3, 6 is idolatry. Worshiping things instead of God. And Colossians says that, that's a real temptation. It's a real temptation for 21st century Americans, isn't it? Worshiping things instead of God. That's what the author to Colossians says. That's a hard teaching for us Americans who are at heart discontented people, aren't we? We're always wanting more and more and more, and we are never satisfied. We are a discontented people. 
Now this statement, be content with what you have, reminds us of other New Testament passages about contentment. The New Testament actually has quite a bit to say about contentment. 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 8, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. If we have food and clothing, basic necessities, we will be content with these. Really? Which of us is content with just basic necessities? Probably there's not a one of us in this room, including me, that is content with just basic necessities. In Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. In other words, contentment comes out of trust. Contentment is a sign of trust, he says. And 2 Corinthians 12, 10 even speaks of being content with weakness, insults, perse hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It follows that statement, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says, I'm quite content with being weak because that means Christ's power can work through me. So how do we learn, how do I learn such contentment that the New Testament talks about, that Paul talks about? Well, he says, his own, he discloses his own secret in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I have learned to be content, he says, with whatever I have. I know how to have plenty, and I know how to do without. I know how to be hungry, and I know how to be filled. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. I can do all things through him or literally in him who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can face whatever circumstance in Christ who gives me strength. So the apostle says the secret of his contentment is living in an intimate, personal relationship, a living relationship with Christ, what Paul calls being in Christ, one of his favorite phrases that he uses dozens of times. I am content, he says, because Christ is enough. Having Christ in my life, being in a living relationship with Christ, that's enough. Christ is all I need. There's a song about that. Jesus is all I need. And that's what Paul says. That's the secret of contentment. To be in Christ and everything that he means by that. Eugene Peterson said, repentance is a decision. Let's go back to where we began with this word repentance that John uses. Peterson says, repentance is a decision. It's even a daily decision. It's not a once upon a time decision. Today, will I live a God-centered life? Today, Will I live a disciple life? Today, will I live a Christ-like life? Today, will I live an in-Christ kind of life? What will I do today? John says, share what you have. Do right. Be content. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Paul would say contentment begins with faith in Christ, and in the Apostles' Creed we affirm that faith in our Lord. So if you care to join with me as we recite together this ancient creed saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried, he descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead and descended into heaven. There he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We will turn our attention to a quite long prayer list today. Some new additions to it. Uh, we continue praying for cancer patients. I'm just going to read first names. Whitney, Corey, Lisa, and I, I will pause there for a moment. That is Angie's sister, and Lisa is now under hospice care. 
Haley, Leah, Judy, Eloise, Janice, and Charles. Frank, uh, I spoke with Frank a couple days ago. He was having a pretty good day, but he has another chemo treatment coming up, and he's had some rough days lately. And then Brian, Josh, we had it last week. That's uh, the uh, uh, Joanne and Tom's uh, nephew. Uh, Susanna uh, and Bill. And then also continuing to pray for other needs. Amy, uh, Amy in recovering from her shoulder surgery. Her mother, Wahila Hala. They are looking for a memory care unit for Amy's mother. And so I uh, can pray for guidance for that. Jimmy, who continues to be in rehab and making rather slow progress. Valerie would like us to continue to pray not only for her, but also the Willard family and their grief. Um, uh, uh, Scott's father, Frank, continues to, I think it's fair to say, decline, slow decline. Uh, Judy, uh, that's Ashley's mother. Uh, Jimmy, um, a, a friend of Robert's. Um, and uh, the Tom and, uh, well, Tom and Donna's daughter, Taylor, some of you saw, gave birth to a daughter this week, but I had a text from Donna this morning yesterday. Taylor spent seven hours in the ER with postpartum issues. And so Donna has asked prayer, special prayer for Taylor. Um, and that's why they're not here this morning. They're exhausted from yesterday and, and also with um, uh, taking care of Blakely. And then, um, uh, Donna has also asked us to remember Edith, who is the mother-in-law of their son Evans. The, the mother-in-law of their son Evans. She was in a serious car accident, probably going to be going to the Spain Rehab Center in Birmingham. I mentioned Tracy Loveman, who many of you know, her father died this week. And also, uh, Heather has asked us to remember, uh, some of you know, uh, Joyce Ann's caregiver, Sandy. Her daughter and grandson, Haley and Kate, are having problems, so we want to remember them also. So it's a very long list today, and there may be others that you want to add silently to that list, and we'll take a moment for you to do that. Then I will lead us in prayer, and of course, we will pray the Lord's Prayer using the debts and debtors first as we pray. Let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer. Our Father, sometimes the needs that confront us are overwhelming. So many needs we have just listed, and we didn't even mention the needs of all of those in Kentucky and surrounding states who have literally lost everything. And so in the face of overwhelming need, we are thankful that we can come to you and that we can, as one of the songwriters said, put our burdens on you. That you we're thankful that you daily bear our burdens, as the psalmist said. And so all the burdens of all this concern, all these needs, all these worries, and all these pains, we rest upon you. And we ask that you, you, that you would touch every point of need with your loving presence, with your healing power, and with your all-sufficient grace. So we hold before you. All of us, all those hearing my voice, we hold before you and we remember before you also all of those that we have just named, whether silently or aloud, and we entrust them all to your grace and to your care as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue our worship now by receiving our tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm.
how should we live then is the question. And we will think about that and make decisions as Donna Kay plays quietly. If our decision is a public decision, maybe we want to become a member of this, officially a member of this congregation, or we need to accept Jesus as Lord for the first time, or maybe we just need special prayer. You're welcome to come to the front, and I will join you as, as we do that. So let's uh, think quietly as Donna Kay plays. by the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May we live such God-centered lives that our lives will bring glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God reigning forever and ever. Amen. In just a minute, we will begin our congregational meeting. You're welcome to stay. If you need to leave, feel free to do so. God bless you.